Hello, Graham. Welcome. Good to see you today on our author interview for the book, How to Be a Six Star Business. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm so excited. This, obviously, these, these interviews are really a way for our readers and, and audiences to get to know you better. And, mm -hmm. you know, you've they've hopefully read your chapter, uh, they're interested in it, and now they want to know who you are, the person behind the, behind the chapter. So I've got a few questions. And to start off, perhaps you could, if you could let, let us know sort of who are you, where are you in the world, uh, who mm -hmm. do you serve, and perhaps something that you like to do outside of work. Okay. Um, so I'm based in Hong Kong. Um, I've been in Hong Kong for just over 30 years. Um, in that I moved here about 30 years ago, but then I've, I spent a bit of time in Singapore, came back to Hong Kong, Taiwan, back to Hong Kong. And most recently, I was based in Tokyo for a few years. Um, we moved back to Hong Kong as a family about 20 years ago. So it's, uh, there's some kind of um, magnetic draw, if you like, uh, from Hong Kong. Um, I'm originally from New Zealand. Um, and I, I graduated in linguistics and psychology without a sort of a very obvious career path. And over the course of my career, found that I was getting involved in organizational um, design work and organizational change. Um, so I then got interested in that and did some more postgraduate work around uh, organizational behavior, organizational psychology. Uh, trained in psychotherapy as well and even did a little bit of uh, dispute resolution and mediation. Um, none of it was particularly planned up front, but standing where I am now and looking back, I think the common thread that's pulled it all together is my real interest in how one person or one group of people influences and affects the behavior of, of others. And so I typically work with leadership teams or leaders in organizations who are trying to bring about change um, and who want to want to have a, a sustainable impact uh, in what they're doing. Um, and so whether that's at the start of the process to try and help them uh, do it as well as possible or when the process has run into some challenges or difficulties, that's typically the kind of uh, place we mm -hmm. start. Wow, that um, sounds very comprehensive, but also extremely important and detailed and focused. Um, I think it's become more important um, now. I mean, I started really getting interested in this area when in the I guess around around the time of the, the financial crisis, lots of organizations were saying, we need our people to be better at solving complex problems, at, at innovating, coming up with creative solutions to difficult challenges. Um, and it felt to me like there are, there's an environment or a culture that will lend itself to that. And there are lots of other um, environments and cultures that are not very conducive to that. So for me, it mm -hmm. brings together sort of human performance and well-being and organizational outcomes. Um, maybe when we started looking at it, we were a little bit ahead of our time. And I think what's happened in the last two years, um, particularly with COVID, has brought it into the spotlight to say we really, um, and, you know, as we move more into a knowledge-based economy where we are looking to people uh, to solve complex challenges and to be creative and collaborative in how they do that, it's starting to get a little more uh, attention and, and focus. Absolutely. And that's certainly been my experience in, in hearing what's going on in, in the corporate landscape um, at my end. So it, it, I'm sure that it's just going to continue. You know, it feels like there's still a lot of unanswered questions by, um, you know, industries and corporates and people that need solving. Yeah, I think so. Um, and I think it has some sort of sharp economic uh, edges to it as well. It's not something which you do in isolation of performance and, and the other sort of measures of organizational um, outcomes. Um, it could be part of the ESG um, kind of reporting initiative. And we know with a lot of evidence now that companies that do report ESG outcomes benefit from that by uh, lowering the cost of capital when they go to capital markets to raise money uh, to do other things. Um, I think this whole area fits under the S, the, the social dimension of ESG reporting. Um, mm -hmm. And we just know that as technology takes over more and more of the routinized elements of work, what we need humans to do are the complex creative um, mm -hmm. sort of uh, elements of it. And if we can create the conditions and sustain the conditions where they can do that well, that has to be better for the organization and probably also better for the people involved too. Absolutely, and therefore, the planet. 
communities. Yeah, yeah, I, I think so. Um, like a lot of these things, there's a risk, I think, that we get caught up in buzzwords and we, you know, we think yeah. about wellness or well-being and we make that an umbrella. Underneath, we put a whole lot of interventions and activities as if the other things not under the umbrella don't influence the outcome. But we, we know that they do. So I prefer to think of it as a lens through which we can look at the organization and say what positively and negatively affects well-being. Um, and I'm really intrigued by uh, people like Harvard, the School of Public Health at Harvard, for example. Um, they don't even talk about well-being. They call it health. And they say that businesses, and particularly what we're describing as six-star businesses, they affect the health of consumers, employees, communities, um, and the environment overall. And I think that's true. And I think it's a really mm. positive and constructive way to look at that relationship, um, to say this, this is about the health of everybody from individual consumers and employees all the way up to the overall um, planet um, and, oh, society, the environment and, and the planet. Why not? Yeah, absolutely. It's, um, I love it. So tell me, what specifically is your chapter about? I've looked at how do we go about taking a really systematic approach to improving well-being um, at work or health at work, whatever we want to call it. Um, the challenges with it, I guess, are the umbrella version is, is attractive because it looks like, you know, if it's under an umbrella, you can give it to somebody to have responsibility for it and to be accountable. You can have neatly defined um, actions that take place. Um, and it looks good from that point of view. If you take the lens view, it's more difficult in a way because it's systemic and it run it, it, it sort of overlays the way the organization works. But you're much more likely to get to root cause um, mm. and to really create a, um, a, a sustainable advantage, let's call it that. So what I've tried to do in the chapter is make what could be a really, really complex, multi-layered challenge practical and easily implementable. And one of the points I make is that you know, this is an opportunity to, to engage the people in the organization in shaping um, how, how, we attack, how we address it. Um, well-being isn't quite like some of the other things, uh, like, for example, environmental design. I mean, that's quite objective, and you can have an external mm -hmm. perspective. The people who judge the effectiveness of a well-being strategy or a health strategy are the people who, who experience it on, on a day-to-day -day mm -hmm. basis at work. There's a great opportunity to involve and engage people um, and sort of do things like diversity and inclusion by being diverse and inclusive, involving people throughout the organization. So that's what I've tried to do in, in 1,800 words that wasn't necessarily very easy, but uh, that's what I tried to do anyway. <laughs> I could imagine. And I love what you said there about being, as in trying yeah. to get the outcome by being in that space uh, rather than being the objective lens. Yes. So that's brilliant. Um, what's, uh, I guess you've, you've, you've answered my next question, I think, in a way, which is what, what's one aha or idea or action step someone can take after reading your chapter? Well, yeah, I, I think the most obvious thing to do is start from understanding what people in the organization think well-being at work is, what positively and negatively contributes to it, and what they think could improve it. Uh, mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that everything that they say is automatically translates to something you could do, but it will give you a really good insight into the employee perspective. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the other points is that we shouldn't really think about well-being as a separate notion by itself. It needs to be linked to performance and linked to other things that matter to the organization. Um, and I think there is a way to bring those two agendas together and create a, a solution which works well for the organization and well for the individual people who work in that organization. Mm. Um, whether those are aha moments or not, I'm, I'm not sure. But uh, what we do see is there's a rush to market of the mo at the moment of lots and lots of initiatives which typically tackle I think mostly the individual resilience aspect um, of well-being or maybe the workplace environment um, you know the physical environment aspects of well-being um, and those are good to have but it's a little bit more involved and a bit more complicated than that um, but it that we shouldn't let that get in the way of 
taking small steps and maybe even experimental steps that, uh, that improve things. And maybe that's an aha in itself, that we don't have to mm. solve the whole thing with a grand strategy, involving people in shaping small steps that can be taken. And if they don't work, just don't keep doing them. But if they do yeah. work, um, look at ways that they can be, they can be scaled. Mm, I love that. And, you know, true change takes time. It's not, it's not just a, oh, do this one step and tomorrow you'll be, you'll be there. It doesn't yeah. quite work like that, does it? No, exactly. Hmm. Would you suggest, say, that uh, uh, in order to be a six-star business, no matter what the size, one must look at well-being in some respect? I think so, yes. Um, on the basis that ultimately whatever the organization does has an impact on well-being. The choice is not not to have an impact. The choice is what kind of impact you, you want to have and, and mm -hmm. how much benefit you get as a business from, from doing that. Um, this isn't about altruism. It's not about doing things just for the sake of being nice. I, I think we're moving to an era more and more where the two things come together and one connotes the other. That If you look after the well-being of people, um, mm -hmm. your customers, your employees, um, the community that, that you happen to be based in, that in itself will lend, it, uh, lend itself to uh, business results as well. Yeah, fantastic. Um, so what's been the biggest gift to you on your journey, your career journey, I guess, to this point uh, now? I think probably I would say the willingness of people to engage with the topic. Um, and I, I'm talking about people at all levels of organizations and you know, different generations and different backgrounds. Um, and again, maybe in a funny way, COVID has been a gift in that regard because mm -hmm. it's, it's put this topic into the spotlight. It, it, it didn't start with COVID. There was lots of data and lots of evidence long before the pandemic that said the way we're currently running organizations isn't conducive to what we really need in terms of human well-being and performance. Um, COVID in its own way then has has been a gift in that it's now discussable and people are willing to engage and explore and share ideas and information. Because um, again, I think this is it's a bit emergent. Um, and one mm -hmm. of the things we're doing in Hong Kong is putting people together across companies um, to learn from each other and compare notes. Uh, sometimes it's easier, particularly for larger and better established organizations, um, to suggest an idea that's been tried and tested in another organization rather mm -hmm. than something that's just come from a, a, an independent practitioner or consultant. Equally yeah. for small companies, um, they can learn from the experiences of larger organizations or other startups and, and test stuff out much more quickly. So I, I think that's been, uh, that's been a real gift, uh, the willingness of people to engage with the topic and share ideas. That's fabulous. And um, yeah, love it. What would you say has been your greatest challenge along your journey to this point? I would say it, it's a shift in the mental model that we have of how organizations work um, and what, you know, what contribution the, the culture and the environment makes uh, to performance. There are a lot of businesses in Hong Kong that have been very successful without paying too much attention um, to this, this area. Um, the success, I think, has been measured in ways that kind of don't pay attention to what we're talking about in terms of health and well-being. Mm. Um, so it's almost been that you can be successful without having to think about that. Now mm. it's clear that we do have to think about it, but it's a shift in the mental model. And most mm. people, um, as adults who are experienced and have developed a, a way of thinking about the world over time and success, find it quite difficult to change uh, a mental model. Yeah. Um, so I think that's, that's the biggest challenge. This is not yeah. just adopting a new set of ideas or techniques. It's a real shift in the way we think about organizations and the contributions that organizations make to well-being. So that, that's the biggest challenge. Um, yeah. And, you know, as we know, even from the wider sort of uh, healthcare industry, just telling people what to do and giving people data and evidence about the benefits of doing things isn't enough very often um, to drive change. It takes mm -hmm. engagement. It takes listening to the world from their point of view and finding a way to connect 
what you want to offer as advice or counsel with something that they identify as important to them. Once you can make that connection, you tend to get mm. more traction. But, Definitely. you know, in a time poor environment where everybody's wrestling with prolonged uncertainty and the difficulty of just keeping the lights on in, in businesses with high mm. cost bases, it's, it's been challenging to get um, to get sustained attention to that. But uh, we're getting uh, we're making some headway and that's uh, that feels really good. It sounds great. Um, what would you say has been the most important skill that you've learnt along your journey? I think it's a set of skills, uh, and I'm going to steal shamelessly from the Harvard School of Public Health. And they've created this lovely little framework, which by chance spells the word coach. They aren't telling people to become coaches, but they're saying if you want effective uh, interpersonal interaction, this is a framework that helps. And in their model, coach stands for uh, curious, open, appreciative, compassionate, and honest. And their mm -hmm. argument is if you bring those qualities as a leader or as a consultant or as whoever um, that's trying to improve the quality of your interpersonal um, relationships, that's a framework that uh, works quite well. I think it is underpinned by the ability to listen well and to suspend your own judgment. But I think that's it's a set of attributes rather than uh, mm. one particular skill underpinned by the willingness and the ability to listen. That's powerful. Thank you. Uh, last question. What does being six star mean to you and why is it so important? If you look at where the, the notion of starring um, Come, comes from. I mean, I'm most closely associated with um, the hotel industry and you know food and beverage. So when you you rate something as five stars, which is the traditional highest rating, it means a consistently high level of um, service and experience. And I think six star means going beyond that, um, which possibly means not just looking at what the competition is doing and bettering that, but going beyond it in the interest of something that's um, truly meaningful in terms of the quality of experience that people people have. Um, again, if you if we stick with the restaurant metaphor, you know, if you talk about consistently, there are two ends of that spectrum. One is that you do the same thing well all the time and reliably. So most fast food chains aspire to doing that so that wherever you go in the world, you have the same, if you buy the same product, it's the same kind of experience. At the high end, uh, the fine dining experience, it isn't about the same product. It's about the same quality of experience. Um, mm. And I think Six Star builds on that. It says it doesn't mm. matter what kind of industry you're in. It doesn't matter what your sector is. It doesn't matter what the size of your organization is. It's to do with the quality of the experience that your employees and your customers have. Couldn't agree more. And uh, wow, I've just loved that. Everything that you've said there, <laughs> have I passed Graham, the audition? <laughs> I, I think you have. Yes. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for your for sharing your wisdom and for being part of this journey with us. It's very exciting. I hope that everyone who's watched this has gotten to know you a bit better and can actually see the gold in creating the awareness, the un and, and showing understanding. And like you said, the skill that you learnt that set of skills, you know, with that coach acronym from the Harvard Public Health Organization, School of Public Health, yeah. School of Public Health, yeah. All of that combined really is a lot of food for thought. And I think in every business uh, can take a lot from what you've shared with us. So I want to thank you very much. And yeah, really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks. Thanks for the opportunity. I really appreciate that too. You're welcome.